is a preacher's son When his daddy would visit, he'd come along When they gather around, they started talking As soon Billy would take me walking Up through the backyard, we'd go walking Then he looked into my eyes Oh, and those to my surprise The only one who could ever preach me Was the son of a preacher man The only boy who could ever teach me Was the son of a preacher man As he was No matter how hard I try When he started sweet talking to me He come and tell me everything is alright He kiss and tell me everything is alright Then I get away again at night The only one who could ever preach me Was the son of a preacher man Exciting, exciting. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think he's here. I think he's here. I wanna I wanna do a little introduction and then we're gonna bring him on. We just played Son of a Preacher Man, uh, and it was we, you should have seen everybody dancing to it. Here. They're just shaking and rattling and rolling. Um, this man is, he's a musician, he's an arranger, he's a producer. Um, he was on Saturday Night Live, 187 live broadcasts. Um, he played for the Olympics closing ceremony. Uh, he, he participated uh, for music in Sister Act. And he was on the Emmy Awards, the Grammys. He played at Lincoln Center, uh, The Late Show with David Letterman. Um, did, did I mention the Blues Brothers? <laughs> okay, I want to just throw out a few names too. Okay, these are some of the names that he worked with. I can't list them all because we, we, we'd be, we, it would go on for days. Ray Charles, uh, uh, Carly Simon, Tony Bennett, Aretha Franklin, Willie Nelson, Snoop Dogg, Mary, Mary J. Blige, Stevie Wonder, Lady Gaga, Whitney Houston. Okay, I could keep on going, but I'm going to introduce the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> Mr. Tom Bones Malone. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm feeling great. Good. Love you know, we just moved to LA from New York. I was in New York for 52 years and we just moved here about three months ago and we're loving every second of it. I love perfect it. Weather, perfect weather every day. And uh, it always cools off at night and it's dry heat, no sweating. Uh, just just turned 75 years old about a month ago too. It's not that bad. Happy birthday. 
I feel like I'm 18. <laughs> I, well, I feel like I'm 14 sometimes. There you go. There There's, you go. Sometimes 99, but then I go back to 14. I never wanted to grow up. Re is, is, wh where did that come from? Well, I, I think I, it comes from music. Yeah. Um, uh, it, you know, you, you play music, you know, when you, when you, it, it's called play instead of work. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I just still like to play. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and, and, and by the way, you, how many instruments do you play? I play 14 instruments professionally. It's amazing. What, what was the first instrument that you picked up that you put to your lips? I actually played the violin from age five to age 10. And then I gave it up, never should have given it up. Yeah. And then uh, started playing the tuba and then the trombone and then the trumpet and then the saxophone and then the flute and uh, just kept uh, picking up other instruments. Uh, and I started arranging music when I was 13. 13? What was the first piece that you, you arranged? Um, I heard a, a song on the, on the radio, it was called Midnight in Moscow. And I wanted, to know, I, I wanted to know why it sounded the way it did. And so I started taking it apart and writing down every note of every instrument. And um, I had a chance to check my homework. Uh, I was snooping around in the back of the music store one day and I found the arrangement and I made about a 96 on it. Now it's pretty close. So I continued to do that sort of work. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I went to college, I took a course called Music Theory 101 and I answered all the questions. And then the teacher for a couple of weeks the teacher took me out in the hall. He says, you don't have to come to class anymore. You get an A. So I want <laughs> the other, he said, I want the other students to uh, be involved in the class. He says, you already know all this stuff. He should have just had you teach it. <laughs> well, I, I, changed my, I changed my major to psychology, and I, I found that more satisfying. And I could, but I continued my career in music. Why, what about psychology? Why did that interest you? Well, it, it, helps, it helps you get along with other musicians. Right, all right. Now, I want to go back to what you said about the violin. You should have never, said, did you ever go back to the violin to play it? Well, we, um, what happened is uh, we, my father was in the military until I was 11. And we moved every year. My father survived Pearl Harbor, U.S. Navy. So I was born, I was born in Honolulu, 1947. And uh, anyway, uh, I started, uh, I took, took lessons from a guy in the uh, Honolulu Symphony, and I was in the Honolulu Youth Orchestra, and then we moved to uh, Garden Grove, and I was in the Garden Grove Youth Symphony, and then we moved to uh, someplace in Maryland, and I played in the Kitty Symphony, then we moved to Pensacola, I played in the Kitty Symphony, then my, when my dad retired when I was 11 years old, he bought a farm in Mississippi in the middle of nowhere, and there was no orchestra. We, you know, he bought, I, I was milking cows, hauling hay, picking corn. We grew everything we ate, except for maybe rice and coffee. Uh, and- uh, Are you writing a book, I hope? I'm writing a book. Uh, I have 38 chapters already. Working, working title is Name, Name Dropper. Oh, this is great. Of course, with that Obviously, yeah. God. So, but, uh, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been very lucky through my uh, career. Um, I, I played with little Stevie Wonder when he was 16. Oh no, really? Yeah. And I got to play with him several times during my career. He'd come on Saturday Night Live. He'd come on Letterman. He'd come on, we did a TV special down in Washington one time that he was involved in. And uh, he always remembers me. I said to Stevie, it's Tom, the trumpet player from Albuquerque. And he's, and he, he's always remembers me. Last time I saw him was at the Letterman show. I did an arrangement of I Wish. And I ran him to him in the elevator. I said, Stevie, it's, it's Tom, the trumpet player from Albuquerque. And he says, it's nice to see you. <laughs> I swear to God, that's what he said. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh my God, that's making me cheer up just to think of it. I mean, it, when, you just, when, you, when you talk about it, you can feel it. You, you just omit, uh, omit the, the, the experiences. Now you said Albuquerque, what? what, what are you well, I, I played with him in, in, in El Paso and Albuquerque two nights. Right. Uh, back in, was it 1969? Oh, okay, 69. I think. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, he's he's always been an inspiration to me. When when he was 16, uh, he was just recording the songs that the that the uh, uh, staff writers at Motown were writing for him. Right. But anyway, he had a, he had a sophisticated cassette machine and some nice headphones. And he says, you know, he kind of took me in as a friend for whatever reason. And uh, he says, man, I write my own songs. You want to check them out? 
I said, sure. So I put on the headphones and I heard this, all this amazing music. And I said, who played on this? He says, I played everything. Oh. Bass, piano, drums, organ, guitar, uh, all the vocals. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was an inspiration to me. Well, he, he can play all the instruments. I can play all the instruments. And so I record an entire big band at my house by myself. Did right. I send you any of that stuff? Well, yes. Oh, we, uh, yeah. you know, and we played the one with Jay yes. singing. Yes, yes. We and I, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, so, um, you yeah, know, sky's the limit. Uh, I set up my little studio with a nice microphone and the Pro Tools 11, and I learned, to, you know, learned how to work the software. And uh, um, I do production work for people all over the world. People send me their records. I arrange the horn parts, and I put on the whole horn section uh, by myself, and I email it back to them. I have clients in um, South Africa, Amsterdam, uh, New York, Cleveland, Chicago, you know, everywhere. And it's just a matter of emailing stuff back and forth. And you love it. I love it. I eat it up. I can I can feel it. It's like boom, 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 boom. Sometimes when I I'm doing stuff, a lot of different stuff, and sometimes I feel, David, you've got to slow down. But I enjoy doing all of it. Yes. It of sounds like that's that's you. It is indeed. Um, so where did Bones come from? Bones Bones was a um, a nickname that a, a friend gave me in school, uh, in high school. And it didn't really stick, but I remembered that name. And uh, so uh, there was a period in, in, uh, in my history where uh, John Belushi, we, we put together a band that was separate from Saturday Night Live and it was called the Blues Brothers Band. And yeah. we had a meeting at John's house at 60 Morton Street, Greenwich Village. And he, he says, well, now we have, a, a, we have a, a Donald Duck Dunn and a Matt Guitar Murphy in the band. So everybody has to have a middle name. And if you can't make one up that we like, we'll make one up for you. So I just immediately said, Tom Bones Malone. And that they, Danny and John both liked it. And, uh, and Lou Marini says, how about Blue Lou Marini? Bang, done. And so uh, uh, John made up the nickname, Alan, Mr. Fabulous Reuben. And he made up Steve, the Colonel Cropper. And yeah. so anyway, we all ended up with middle names. And uh, so that's, uh, yeah, my friend in high school, Bobby Simmons, gave me that name. And he doesn't even remember giving me that nickname, but uh, it stuck. Mm. Oh, I love that. There, I, was, I was tall and skinny. I, I was like six, two and a half, and I weighed about 145 pounds. So, I, you know, I was skin and bone. So that's where and, I got and, and you were just blowing that air right through all those uh, instruments. Absolutely. Breathing, breathing is a key to playing all the instruments that I play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Breathing. I, by the way, that voice you hear is uh, uh, one of our music teachers, and he's, he's the co-host today because, of course, you know, music and music go together. And, and um, I want to get back to breathing, but I also want to bring in uh, our wonderful Joe CB. Here comes Joe. Hi, guys. Tom, it's a pleasure and a, a privilege meeting you and, and hearing your story and, uh, and your resume is amazing. And uh, wow, it's just incredible. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to be a part of today. It's wonderful to hear your, your take on, you know, music and the art of recording and the art of multi-layer recording and, uh, you know, being a, a multi-instrumentalist and, and, uh, and being, and, and, and throwing yourself into being an engineer and a producer as well, you know, this learning curve at Pro Tools, you know, um, it's just amazing. It's, it's a whole, it's a, that, that in itself is a whole science, isn't it? Well, you can't, we can't, uh, I can't become obsolete in this world. Uh, exactly. Technology is accelerating. And uh, I see people that get left behind in the music business. When I first mm -hmm. moved to New York, 1970, you know, uh, uh, it was all of, all the major TV shows had big bands, but, uh, the writing was on the wall, you know, rock and roll was the new thing. And um, I remember some studio musicians, like uh, I remember a bass player or, and a drummer, they, they both said, they said, uh, this rock and roll thing is never going to last. I said, I'm not going to go there. And those two guys were out of the recording business overnight because wow. the recording business changed. And then I knew other people, like I remember an upright bass player that says to himself, he says, I can play that rock and roll stuff. I can play electric guitar. I mean, electric bass. Yeah, like an upright bass, so let you know the Fender bass would be easy. So, you know, he took it up and he just became. He just kept working. You know, it, uh, you got to. You got to. I see a Fender guitar hanging on your. Uh, set yeah, of 
Yeah. That's, I, that's I have a six, I have a sixty I have a sixty two jazz bass. Oh wow. And that's, a 50, and a fifty nine brown panel uh, amplifier with the two twelves. That's a fifty one reissue, but it's not a real one, of course. It's a fifty one my, my wife bought it for me for my birthday. Wow. Wow. What a yeah. nice lady. What a nice lady. Oh, she's she's the best. I, I we went into uh, Sam Ash. And I yeah. saw it on the wall and I and I went to play it and I gave it back to the man to put on the wall. And he goes, oh, no, here. And he brought the case. And I'm like, what, uh, what, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm, I'm putting it, it back in the case. I said, but it was on the wall. And he goes, yeah, I know your wife just bought it for you. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. 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 Yeah. Oh, there's, there's nothing like the thrill of, 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 a, of a new instrument or an old instrument, uh, you know, but no, yeah, I know. A, new, a new instrument in your life. Yes. 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 The hardest, hardest thing for me was, you know, when I was first getting started out is uh, uh, getting actually getting an instrument to play. You know, uh, when I, I, I wanted to join the marching band and at mm -hmm. the, the high, when I was in seventh, sixth or seventh grade and uh, uh, we went we went to the uh, band hall on a Thursday night with my parents and they, the music store guy had everything set up. I picked up a trombone. I could almost play it. My dad mm -hmm. says, how much? my dad says, how much is it? Uh, the guy tells him the price. He says we can't afford it, so we're we're walking out of the band hall, and the band director grabs me and he says, "You can play the school's tuba. You don't have to buy anything." So I play, that's why I played the tuba. Wow! <laughs> so the, the next year we got a band director that was a trombone player. Saw me looking at his horn in his office. Says you want to play that, don't you? I said, "Yeah." He says I explained my problem, and he said, "So he loaned me his own personal trombone. Show wow. me what the positions were. Take this home and learn how to play it." And so I did, and I was first chair in about three weeks. And um, not that the you know the band wasn't that um, yeah highly skilled, but anyway. Uh, so my grandmother gave me hundred dollars out of her social security check to buy a trombone. Wow! Boy, then that's my, then my little brother got a cornet. So when he wasn't playing it, I learned how to play that. And then. Uh, when I was 14, some kids came over to my house, and a drummer and a couple of guitar players and a sax player. Mm -hmm. They said, we're going to start a rock and roll band. You, you, want, to be, you want to be in it? I'm like, yeah, I want to be in it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I wanted to hang with the guys and I wanted to meet girls. So, you know, the usual. And uh, absolutely. So, so I got at my trombone. This is 1960. I got at mm -hmm. my trombone and they looked at me like I was crazy. And it's like, uh, I said, what's up? And they said, you don't have trombones in rock and roll bands. And I said, why not? I said, well, mm -hmm. you just don't. So uh, I said, well, I want to be in the band. Uh, what do I have to do? He said, you got to play saxophone. So my friend that was there had a tenor and an alto. And see, he started teaching me how to play tenor sax right then and there, right that night. And we worked out some songs that night. I was wow. motivated to learn how to play this instrument. So I got a fingering chart and I practiced. And uh, we, were, we were playing gigs. Uh, four weeks later, we, were, we played our first gig. And so I started playing professionally at 14. And we played some stock hops and we played some really sleazy clubs down in South Mississippi. He wouldn't believe. I told Dan Aykroyd the story about playing in a club where uh, they had chicken wire over the bandstand, you know, in case it got rowdy. Oh no. <laughs> because he put that in the movie. They would, they would throw stuff at the stage sometimes, yeah. Yeah. What, what, what would you consider your first big break? Uh, Oh, wow, wow, wow. Uh, oh, oh, let's see. Well, oh, who was it? Who was this? Um, who was it? Who, who, who did the song Rocking Around the Christmas Tree? Oh, um, girl, uh, young girl, young artist from uh, Nashville. Uh, Brenda Lee. I, Brenda Lee. Oh, yes. Brenda Lee. Brenda Lee. Yeah. I got called to play uh, lead trumpet with Brenda Lee in Jackson when I was in college. And it was 80 miles away and I didn't have a car. So I had to hitchhike up every night. And this is when I was going to school in Hattiesburg. So I, I had to hitchhike up every night. Paid, good paying job too, paid $17 a night. Mm -hmm. So I went up there, I played, went up there every night, uh, hitchhiked up and hitchhiked back. And I never caught a ride until the sun came up coming, coming home. Oh my God. Yeah. So anyway, I was the only guy that could hit the high note on the trumpet to play the lead trumpet part. And uh, the full cycle, uh, I, was at the, I was in the house band at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Awards when Brenda Lee was inducted and she remembered the job. She remembered playing at the club. Wow. Yeah. So. Uh, what yeah. a cool memory, man. That's full so cycle. Cool. 
Oh, I got another a story that you, you might enjoy. Okay. Uh, the Blues Brothers almost never got off the ground. This is something that you've never heard. Uh, I was at the first meeting about the Blues Brothers. John and Danny had this idea of these two characters that were ne'er do well musicians in Chicago, and they 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 wore sunglasses day and night, and they were they were orphans and they were uh, emotionally undeveloped. And um, so anyway, so it was just the three of us at the meeting: John, Danny, and Bones. And um, uh, it's the four I was Bones actually. And uh, so uh, I wrote an arrangement of a song called Rocket '88, and we rehearsed the Saturday Night Live band, and we did it for Lauren Michaels didn't make the show. Mm. So the next week I did this arrangement of Hey Bartender and we rehearsed the Saturday Night Live band and did it for Lauren. And week number two, Lauren, Lauren said, frankly, I don't see anything funny about the Blues Brothers. So we, we you know, didn't make that the second week. So the third week, John, Danny, Blues Brothers this week? They said, we're wasting our time if Lauren doesn't like it. We gotta move on. So, okay. So after read through on Wednesday, about 3.15 in the afternoon, Lauren Michaels comes out of read through and he says, the show's three minutes short. What are we going to do? And uh, uh, John and Danny jumped right on him and said, Lauren, the Blues Brothers. So Lauren says, we have nothing worthwhile to put in those three minutes. You guys might as well make fools of yourselves. He put us on. And I, I could say that the rest is history. Oh my God, that's crazy. Wow, what <laughs> a story. What, no, where, did, where did you meet, where did you meet Dan and, and, and John? Well, I was in the uh, I was in the original band at Saturday Night Live. October third, mm -hmm. nineteen seventy five, was our first show, and, and uh, right I became the arranger for the show. Right. Wow. And the music director called me to meet with them, you know, because they needed an arrangement. And I got to, I got to play with a lot of people, like you know, just uh, um, a group called the Band from Woodstock came on the show, right. spring of nineteen seventy six. Music director said, "Why don't you write some horn parts for the, some of their songs?" And so I did, and. Uh, I hit it off with all these guys. They loved the charts and they took me on the road at summer 76. Uh, took me on the road with the band in the horn section. And in the fall uh, and Thanksgiving 1976, we did a movie called The Last Waltz. I know that. Uh, with Martin Sorsese in uh, San Francisco. So uh, that started a whole relationship. After, after the, the original band somewhat broke up uh, after, the, after The Last Waltz and Levon Helm formed his own band with mm -hmm. uh, with Dr. John, Booker mm -hmm. T. Jones, uh, Paul Butterfield, Steve Cropper, Doc Dunn, uh, Lou Marini, Alan Rubin, Tom Malone, uh, Howard Johnson. We uh, we did a uh, Japan tour and a few gigs around the United States, did two albums. Uh, and then so later down the road, uh, when John and Danny were putting together a Blues Brothers band, I recommended Steve Cropper and Duck Dunn. And it, mm. It changed the whole style of the band. At that point, the band was Chicago blues. And, mm -hmm. and so at, when they joined the band, then they, they brought their Memphis influence into the into the scene. So we started doing, you know, Wilson Pickett and Eddie Floyd songs. Uh, mm -hmm. and it was really, uh, it turned out to be a really good thing. That's amazing. What a uh, cool story that is. That is just amazing. Uh, I'm hearing these stories and I'm hoping when you when you have your your book come out, you also do an audio version because to hear it from your soul, yes, yeah, is that's that's it's different than reading it. It's much different than just reading the pages. Oh, I'm like listening to you, and I'm tearing up because the stories are so rich, they're so full, and they're so heartfelt. And so I thank you for that. I thank mm -hmm. you for sharing your life with us. My pleasure. Um, I'm going to throw out a name. Okay. Whatever comes to your mind, Paul Schaefer. Oh, well, I met Paul Schaefer at the original Saturday Night Live. Yeah. He just, he just came over for, for lunch a couple, a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, uh, you know, he's happened to be out in LA, but uh, uh, unusual, he has an unusual genius. He has a degree in sociology, by the way. My degree is in psychology. His degree is in sociology. He just sort of picked up music and uh, he has perfect auditory recall. He remembers everything he's ever heard. Wow. He remembers, he hears a song, he's got it. He remember, you know, he hears a song when he's 10 years old. He remembers it note for note still. Wow. And uh, uh, he, rem he remembers conversations word for word that he and I had in 1975. And he just came to New York and I was telling him about New York. Remember when you said this and remember when I said this and he recounts the whole conversation. Yeah, yeah. So he's a pretty amazing guy on several <laughs> levels. 
and he he can play any of these songs. You know, he he probably has twenty thousand songs in his brain too. You name a song, he can start playing it, and he can play it in any key. That's crazy. Yeah, instantly, yeah, yeah. If you if you, you I've used him on recording sessions before, and uh, you don't have to write him a chart. You just play the song one time, and bang, he's got it. <laughs> and is yeah. that is that with a connection to, of course, to late night? Well, um, here's the real story about late night. Um, when uh, let's see. So I was at Saturday Night Live from 75 to 85. Right. I took a little time off to do the Blues Brothers movie, but I was basically the arranger for the show for, for from 75 to 85. And I was the music director from 81 to 85. Mm -hmm. So uh, arranger and contractor and music director. And uh, so uh, one day I got a call in 1982, I got a call from my unit manager. Liz Anderson was her name, Norwegian lady. And she says, I got a new job. I'm, a, I'm the associate producer of the David Letterman show. And I said, what's that? She says, you've never seen it. It comes on real early in the morning, but we're changing the show to late, late night. And we need somebody to lead a four piece band and be a personality. And I wonder if you'd be interested. And so the, the, the financial offer was about 20% of what I was making at Saturday Night Live. So I said, you should call this kid, Paul Schaefer. He'll take care of it. Paul had gone out to the coast to, to be an actor in a TV series called A Year at the Top. And they did mm. about six or seven episodes and then the network pulled the plug on it. And so mm. Paul, Paul came back to town about two weeks before this phone call. So I said, you should call this kid Paul Schaefer. And I gave her Paul Schaefer's number. And next mm. thing I know, uh, I have in my office, I had a network feed monitor in, the, uh, in my office. I'm writing an arrangement and I hear this band playing and I look over at the screen and there's Paul Schaefer, Steve Jordan, Will Lee and Hiram Bullock. And Paul got the job. Nobody even told me. So. Wow. So anyway, that and that was downstairs in our building. So I occasionally wander down there if I had time and and say hello to the cats. And uh, um, at one time, I remember hanging out with Lee Otwater down there, who was the head of the Republican Party, but he also a rhythm and blues guitar player. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting. A lot. I got a million stories like that. So uh, when Paul got to uh, when the show went to CBS from NBC to CBS, he got in. Uh, pressure from the network to enlarge the band because all the other shows in that time slot had bigger bands. So when he added uh, two horns, he added me on trumpet and Bruce Kapler on tenor sax and uh, boom, wow. back on television. So uh, it was nice of Paul did, to do that. Did you guys, did you get to play with Anton Fig in that band? Every night, every night. Yeah. I love Anton. I love Anton. Amazing drummer guy. He's from Cape Town, South Africa. And yeah. uh, he's uh he was recently on the road with Joe Bonamassa. Uh, I love Joe too. Really good guitar player. Yeah. And he has, a, he has a, strangely enough, I just ran into uh, the guy that's in charge of Joe Bonamassa's uh, guitar collection. I just ran into him at, at uh, LAX the other day as I was flying oh. to Nashville for a gig. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. He, had, and he, was, he was right behind me on the airplane and he had two guitars in these old cases and, and they were, yeah. you know, he bought a seat for them. The oh two wow! Cars are buckled yeah. in the seat next to him. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. You don't put those in cargo. That's for sure. I like it. But Anton's one of the best drummers in the world. It just yeah, I I know him through Ace Freely. Um, Ace yeah. Freely, yeah, yeah, sure, of course. And, and one, of guys, one of the yeah. nicest guys too. One of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, Anton. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I only met him briefly through Ace Freely. But that's the key. That's the key to success in any field that you decide to go into is that be nice to everybody. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Now, some of you people are staring at me like, yeah, your mother told you that, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. Well, your mother was <laughs> right. And you know, I, I, like, um, you know, don't ever think that you're superior to anybody else. You know, in, in the eyes of God, uh, we're all on the same level. And so. Yeah. And, and I'll give you a, an example of how of being how being nice to somebody can pay off. You never know who's going to open a door for you in your life. When I was a music director at Saturday Night Live, I had a friend named Rich Gentile, and he was an intern. So it wasn't like I was up here and down. No, we, we're we're on the same level. He's a nice guy. We became friends. It's you know it's a non-paying job. It's a, like you're in college and you try to make some connections. So one day, Rich says to me, he says, "Bones, I got an entry entry level job." at NBC Sports. I'm like, congratulations, Rich. And he says, Bones, if I ever need a band, I'm going to call you. And I said, well, how nice of him to say that. Did I think take it very seriously? No. But still, 
four years later, the kid calls me up and he says, Bones, he says, I'm, I'm the producer of the Fox 5 sports show in Chicago. Wow. We need a theme for our show. You think you could write one? I'm like, yeah. So I wrote one, recorded it, sent it to him, and ran for years. Um, same guy, Rich Gentile, calls me up. It was 90, 1993. Was it 93 or 94? Might have been 94. And uh, uh, he says, Bones, it's, I'm producing four TV specials for Coca-Cola in Atlanta. Uh, called backstage at the, at the Super Bowl. It's going to be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then the Super Bowl is on Sunday in Atlanta. So you want to you want to be the music director? Do you want to bring a band out from New York? You want to write the charts? You know? Yeah. So I mean, how nice of the kid to uh, think of wow. to do that. And then a few years later, he calls me, but he says, "Bones, I'm I'm uh, pr producing a TV special for Coca Cola called Backstage at the World Cup in Los Angeles at the Universal lot. And you want to be the music director? You want to get a band together?" Oh, oh yeah, uh, I had Terry Bozio, uh, Jeff, Jeff Skunk Baxter. I had the Jerry Hay Horn section. <laughs> you know, ridiculous, wow. ridiculous band. And so, I mean, how nice of how nice of the kid to uh, think of me. And um, so, the after party after after the show's over, I'm sitting at the table with the producer and the director, and uh, the president of Coca Cola comes up to the table. Said, "I really enjoyed the music." So I said, "He says to me, where are you sitting tomorrow?" And I, I uh, well, uh, I'm not going. He says, why not? I said, well, uh, uh, I don't have a ticket. So he goes up to his room and comes down and gives me a ticket to the World <laughs> Cup. So now I'm on the phone. All the flights in and out of LA have been booked for six months in advance. So there's no way for me to get home, go to the show and, 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 uh, and get home to do Letterman on Monday. So uh, make yeah. a long story short, I still have the ticket unused ticket to the world. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, incredible, man. Well, you know, we have uh, uh, we, uh, we have some uh, we have a lot of students here who, who've been wanting to ask que questions about um, many things. So we're going to bring on one now her. I've known her for 25 years now, going on 26. Shannon. Derex, Shannon Derex. Hey. <laughs> Hi, Shannon. Hey, um, what's your favorite jazz music? My favorite jazz music? Oh, I've got so many favorites. Um, I, um, I played with Gil Evans for the last 15 years of his life. Gil Evans was known as the best jazz arranger for his work with uh, uh, Miles Davis. And mm. uh, yeah, uh, Sketches in Spain, Miles Ahead, Morgan and Bess. Uh, and he became my father for the last, his last 15 years of his life, from 73 to 88. And uh, uh, so, I mean, you know, I just always love jazz. There's something about improvising, creativity that I, I love about jazz. You know, I actually played on the road with Woody Herman and I recorded with Buddy Rich and I played with Louis Belson's big band in, uh, in, in, in LA. Actually, when I was, when I was, I moved to LA to work with Frank Zappa in 1972. And when I was in town, I played lead trump trombone with uh, Louis Belson's band at uh, Dante's. Anybody remember Dante's on Lancashire? Anyway, That's um, familiar. but yeah, I love jazz. Uh, one of the most memorable jazz experiences was the Japan tour, 1983, Miles and Gill. Yeah. And uh, Cicely Tyson was Miles' girlfriend on the road. Oh. Um, and uh, that was, but that was an incredible five week tour. And then I, I also played on the last recording with Miles Davis in Montreux, Switzerland with Quincy Jones. Wow. Miles passed away about three, three weeks later. Yeah. Mm. And we mm. had, to, I remember that especially because we had a night off in Montreux the next night and Claude Knobs ahead of the festival says, George Clinton is playing here tomorrow night. He didn't bring his horn section. Do you want to, you want to play with him? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> George, so Lou Soloff, George Adams and I were the horn section for George Clinton the next mm. night. Yeah. So you just never know what's going to happen in life. You just got to be ready. You got to be ready. And we just made up parts on the stage. Wow. Yeah. I love the improvisation of, of music, life. Yeah. It, yeah. It, but it, your, your willingness to say yes is amazing. And, you, and your, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, that's what so many people don't realize is the availability, being on time, being friendly, um, you know, being easy to work with, all those things keep repeat business, you yeah. know? And the more, the more ammunition you have, like the more different styles of music you can play, oh. the chances you have of, of being employed. I played on all the salsa records in New York, on the, all the Fania records, Willie Colon, Hector Laveau, Ruben Blaze, Johnny Pacheco, uh, uh, Mongo Santa Maria. Uh, I played on all those records. And uh, I, play, I played on all of the um, Hasidic rock recordings in, uh. in the film too, yeah. Oh yeah, Mordecai Ben David. You know, if you ever went, if you ever went to a, um, a bar mitzvah or, uh, or, a, or a Jewish wedding, they, they always play Mashiach, that was his big hit song. I played mm. with his band, I played with his band for years. Uh, we wow. sold at Wembley in London. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. I sure. love to, isn't it great, Shannon? You ask one question and it just floods out. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. So, great. Thank you, Shannon. Thank what, you. what kind of music do you like, Shannon? I like any type of music. There you go. Now, see, that's the right attitude. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, because there's a lot of good, good music in every style, right? That's absolutely correct. You know, I used to, I used to like everything except country music, and now country music has changed. Country music's not really country anymore. It's just pop music. You know, sometimes yeah. they wear cowboys, wear boots, but it's it's just yeah. nice pop music. And some of the best composers of pop music are in Nashville now. Oh, some of the lyricists are, are just incredible. Oh my God, like the the, the stories in country music. Oh, are, oh yeah, they're so. I mean, oh. I love their ability to take something so small like you know writing a song about a waitress that she's invisible to everybody else but she's a hero to a little boy at home waiting for her you know like that kind of, they, oh, yeah. Yeah. able to blow up those yes they're able to blow up those what you would call like a mundane thing that people don't normally look at and suddenly it's the focal point you know oh yeah well there's always there's always something there's always something interesting uh to, yeah. uh, to write about and something that you know people can relate to you know real life that's real yeah. life yeah I'm, i want to throw out a name see what comes to your mind um sally sally oh my goodness yeah i uh i met my wife sally at the airport at jfk airport 15 years ago and uh <laughs> I, I i had been i was divorced about six months and uh i see this kind of cute girl behind me in the, in the uh, before we go through the security x-ray. And then I see her on the other side. And I see her zipping up her boot. I said, where are you headed? She says, LA. I said, me too. What flight? She's on an earlier flight. So did you live in New York or LA? And she says, both. Hmm. So I said, well, where do you live in LA? And she says, do you know LA? I said, well, I moved out there to play with Frank Zappa in 1972. And she says, Gail Zappa is one of my clients and Moon and Dweezil and Ahmed and the whole family. Or her clients. So what are the chances of that happening? So we started talking and talking and I went for a cup of coffee before she had to get on her flight first. And then uh, so uh, gave her my card and I said, call me uh, you know, when you come back to town. She was planning to come back to town in about a month. So uh, we started talking before she got there about a week in advance and we went out and it was all over. Uh, best thing that ever happened to me. That's wild, man. What a great story that is. And she, she was a uh, she understands my life in entertainment too. She was a, a professional professional ice skater for the ice skate for mm. four years, uh, Hollywood actress, uh, dancer on the Donnie Marie show. So uh, and so she understands my life. And she's been a, uh, a nutritional consultant for the last 35, 40 years. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Well, she, uh, she has saved my life. Well, she keeps me healthy, I, I can tell you that much. Uh, great. Yeah, I lost 30 pounds during the pandemic. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm 175. And, That's uh, amazing. I work out every day. I do 400 crunches. Uh, I do, you know, hand weights, uh, chest weights. Uh, I walk every day and, uh, you know, just trying to trying to stay alive. My doctor says I'm going to 100. Wow. You, you know who turned 100 today? Who's that? Norman Lear. Yeah, you're right. I just saw that. on the. I saw that. Yeah. Wow. wow. What a brilliant guy. Well, hopefully we'll all get there too. <laughs> yeah. That you would know, be nice. I had a friend who wanted to make it so bad. I went to high school with him and he I wanted to know, he says, if you think about it, 
please ask him his favorite story on Letterman. Favorite story on Letterman? Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, it's, it's not really suitable. I, oh. <laughs> well, or should I tell it anyway? If you, if you feel comfortable with it. Yeah. Well, um, so we're, you know, we're, Letterman's doing the monologue and he says, uh, I say, the guy in Kansas City got arrested for having sex with a cash machine. <laughs> and <laughs> yesterday, and, and I said, I, I whispered to Paul, we have this little intercom system. I whispered to Paul in, in my microphone. I said, he wanted to come into money. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let it, so, so Paul stopped the show and gave Letterman the, the punchline and this the, you know the show was just it was, we I think we were off for about two minutes and Dave was like where were you at the meeting you know and the band has to write some material for the show now so when it went, it went on so that was my little 15 seconds uh, oh my god that was funny, funny man. oh my god yeah it didn't didn't mean anything dirtier or, you know otherwise it was yeah, just, yeah. It was just humor. No, yeah, fun. yeah. We gotta have we gotta have humor, especially nowadays. Uh, oh no, I oh, know. Playing with Snoop, playing with Snoop Dogg was outstanding uh, oh. on on Letterman. Uh, playing with Willie Nelson. Yeah. Willie Nelson, I mean, we, he came on and we were backing him up. He just pointed at me on the you know when the show was rolling and just pointed at me to play a, play a solo. And I'm, oh, bang! So, yeah, it's uh, uh, there's so many so many wonderful moments on that stage. You know, where did you about. where did you learn to improvise like that, or have you always? Is it just in your system? Well, when and I started playing, I started playing saxophone. You know, with that band I was telling you about when I was fourteen. Mm -hmm. But I always, uh, I always wanted, um, I always wanted to make the trombone a rock and roll instrument. You know, especially mm -hmm. after that day, they told me, "Oh, we don't need a trombone in our band." So, uh, I, my, I, the way I wanted to make the trombone a rock and roll instrument was to make the trombone sound like a saxophone. I, conceptually, I would play a trombone solo, but I'm thinking saxophone, you know, and thinking about all of the soul records that I've heard that had sax solos on them, all the jazz records that I've heard, you know, with saxophone solos. And so, uh, and it, and it kind of worked. <laughs> Yeah, that's really cool. That's like Alan Holdsworth tried to make his guitar sound like a saxophone. That was Alan you know, he, Holdsworth, brilliant, brilliant. Oh, I love Al. I loved him. He was so he was so amazing. Oh, he left us too early. <laughs> yeah, he sure did. He sure did. We have another uh, uh, another uh, question from one of our um, family here, Mr. Mark Wells. Mark Wells is here today. Hi. Hey, how are you, Mark? Us uh, good. Uh, we just moved a couple of weeks ago to Moving. another apart to another Moving. apartment. Moving is tough. We just went through yeah, that. two, three. Yeah. Ah, wow. Um, I got a question for you. Okay. Uh, that my mom gave me. Um. Uh. Which, uh, which, which was your first brass instrument that you played in high school? Uh, that was the tuba. Tuba. Oh. It was a tuba. I was actually seventh grade, but it was a high school. The, the school I went to in Mississippi was one through 12, all in the same school. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you, you could be in the band. If you could play an instrument, in, you could be in the band at fourth grade. So we had a 28-piece marching band, and they were usually six or seven high school students in the band. Mm. So the music wasn't that complicated. It was the Bennett Band book number one. That was all we played. But, uh, you know, I, I could play the tuba parts and the trombone parts and the trumpet parts. And uh, I just, uh, you know, you learn from wherever you can. But yeah, the tuba was the first brass instrument that I played and then moved on to trombone about a year later. Hey Tom, do you do you read music or do you read charts or do you? No, I don't only I, I can read it perfectly the first time, and I, I'm also a music arranger. You know, I arranged all the music for the Blues Brothers movie. I, mm -hmm. I wrote twenty seven hundred arrangements for television during my career at Saturday Night Live and at Letterman. Oh, here's a, an arranging story. Uh, Paul, uh, w w our general schedule at Letterman was um, we. We did we taped the show from four thirty to five thirty. You know, mm -hmm. then it was shown at eleven thirty at night. But uh, yeah, so uh, go upstairs, 
change clothes, almost out the door. And, Paul, and uh, Paul's assistant says, can you meet with Paul in his dressing room? So Paul says, uh, Renee Fleming is going to do the top 10 tomorrow. Now, granted, it's about quarter to six. Uh, he, says, he says, Renee Fleming is going to do the top 10 tomorrow. Uh, we need 13 opera excerpts by 11 in the morning. Here's a CD with the 13 opera excerpts. And here's Renee, Renee Fleming's latest CD. Figure out what key she should sing them in. Oh, no. <laughs> See, now, ordinarily, ordinarily you, have a, you rehearse with the singer with a piano and figure out the key before you start writing the charts. So uh, I had, uh, uh, what, 11 plus, uh, I had about 15, 16 hours to write this stuff. Wow. And, so I got it done, and um, one 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 was in the wrong key. I had it. I had everything in my laptop. I uh, uh, transposed it in my laptop and printed it out in Paul's office next door to the rehearsal, and uh, everything went smoothly. And I was also I always I, I envisioned Renee Fleming as being a real diva type character who was going to give us a hard time. She turned out to be delightful, great sense of humor, mm. easy to work with, just exactly the opposite of. What I was thinking at four in the morning, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, and you can see that on YouTube. Um, uh, uh, Letterman, top ten, Renee Fleming. It's on YouTube. The whole thing. Okay. Yeah. And, and yeah. anyway, so after Paul gives me the assignment, he says, he says, Bones, how are we going to pull this off? I said, I'll play flute. We'll get our sax player. Aaron will play oboe. We'll hire a clarinet player and we'll hire a French horn player. You know, from my knowledge of uh, opera music, that should do it. And uh, Paul, you'll play the string parts on the string synthesizer, and that worked. It worked. Wow. Uh, that and, and and you know, to be under that kind of pressure um, and to do it all in the time that you did it in, um, you know, this is right here. Uh, you guys watching, Tom, right here. This is why he's successful. He gets a challenge and he handles it and gets it done, doesn't make excuses, doesn't make, gets in there, handles his business and gets it done, gets it done in time. And uh, yeah, yeah. And you gotta be able to, you know, if, if when, when you suddenly accept the challenge, you know whether or not logistically you're able to actually do it in the time that it's oh, yeah. you know, there's, asked of you. There's, uh, there's nothing more deadly than a, a live TV show. There's no, no oh, I, I need another hour. No, you can't, you, you got to get it done. Yeah. Um, I had another experience. Um, one day they, uh, on the Letterman show, they sent a, um, they sent a camera down to Sam Ash Music on 48th Street, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they got the camera. They got the camera on this kid that has a trumpet gig bag over his shoulder. And they say, you want to sit in with the Letterman show band? And the kid says, when? He said, so right now. <laughs> the kid runs away, runs out on the street, gone. So they find a kid with a saxophone over his shoulder. You want to sit in with a letter, letter in Japan? When? Right now. Kid runs away. He runs out of the store. Uh, so then they, they find this girl behind the counter. You know, now she can't, she can't run away. So they say, yeah. are you a musician? Yes. What do you play? Alto sax. You got your horn? Yeah, it's right here. Well, you want to sit in with a Letterman show? Sure. Bang. So now the camera's following her up the street. She comes on the bandstand. Paul says, what songs do you know? She says, I don't really know any songs by memory, but if you can write them out for me. Uh, you know, so uh, Paul just says, uh, uh, isn't she lovely? Tom, what key should she put it in? Tom, write her out a part. Bang, write it. Scribble, scribble. Just as they go to commercial, I hand her the part and we play the song. The rhythm section in that band, we know they knew all the standard songs. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and anyway, we did, you know, we covered every commercial break of the show like that. Well, what, what? Paul, you know, what song should we, should we do? Well, well, what key should we put in? Yeah, so Paul always asked me what key we should put things in. Yeah, that band was ferocious, man. You guys were amazing. Another wow. time, another time, uh, we're, the, the show's already on. We're already recording the show. Paul says, we have to play Stars and Stripes forever to play somebody on with, like, you know, in, uh, yeah. in three minutes. He said, uh, Tom, you play the piccolo part. And, and uh, what key should we play it in? Okay, so I know it's an A flat, but... I'm thinking about the piccolo part. And I, I know the piccolo part because I used to play it on the tuba as a novelty when I was younger. And so uh, I just said, I'm trying to, I'll, G, key of G. 
So now, now that mm. plays, plays pretty easily on the on the piccolo, at least better than A flat. So so we played the song and we and he counts it off really really fast. Da 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 da. And then we ended up playing that song many times on the show. So um, when um, I get a call from the Terra Winds in Atlanta, they, they want to hire me to be their guest artist. They call me six months in advance and I booked the gig. It's a 70 piece concert band made up of music educators in the Atlanta area, all fine musicians. And so three weeks before the gig, they say to me, um, we heard you play Stars and Stripes on the piccolo. We want you to come out in front of the band and play it. Say, so I know it's going to be an A flat. So I'm like, oh no, what am I gonna do? <laughs> so, so I bought a D flat piccolo and now the song is still in G. And so I went out in front of, I went out in front of the band at the concert and played the, played the piccolo solo. And then as, as I was walking back off the stage, 11 piccolo players came up behind me and played it again. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. You never know, you gotta be prepared. You got you got bought it a new piccolo like right there because oh, it was you actually an antique 1907. Wow. D flat piccolo, yeah. I don't know if they even make D flat piccolos anymore. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, it's an antique. Man, but just your ability to adapt and just keep rolling with those punches, man. It's amazing. It's a lot. You've you know, you've, you've been there. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, I like you know, tune and you're like Yeah. yeah. I, I, I've had pressures like where, you know, like I've written music for film and television, like a supervisor and, and they, you know, they need it on their desk by this date. And it's oh, yeah. like, it's yeah. ridiculously close. And they wanted me, like I, I did this one album called Guitar Gods, where I had to sound like all these guitar players from the oh, on Van Halen to Steve Vai to, you know, um, to all the yeah. uh, even classics like Jimmy Page. And then the contract they sent me was, you must know who it is in the first like minute of listening, but it can't be any of their songs. <laughs> oh, right, right. Well, so that's that's a that's a. I got to play with Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page at the same time. Oh my God! Yeah, that's yeah, uh, uh, and with Vinnie Caliuta and Tal Wilkenfeld, <laughs> Rock and Roll Hall oh. of Fame Awards, Cleveland. When was it? Uh, uh, and and uh, yeah, that was an amazing moment of my life too. And the, another amazing moment was uh, uh, when Ringo Starr got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, yeah. Paul McCartney came in to give him the award. By the way, I played on Paul McCartney's most recent album too, uh, Egypt Station. Wow. But uh, anyway, uh, so Paul says, well, we had this band, we had this band in, uh, uh, in Liverpool and our drummer wasn't working out. And so we, we started auditioning drummers that lived in Liverpool. And so we, this one guy comes in, he has a good beat. Another guy comes in, he's got a good beat. Another guy comes in, he's got a good beat. And this guy Ringo comes in, he's got five or six different beats. So he says, I said, I think we should go with Ringo. Mm -hmm. And uh, and both these guys turn out to be very nice people. You know, just be nice to everybody. Both these guys, you know, it's not like I'm up here and he's, you know, I mean, who's bigger than Paul McCartney? No. But, uh, he's just a regular guy. He just It's just like he talks to me, like, uh, you know, it's a session. He's just nicest guy. I understand mm -hmm. why they call him Sir Paul. Mm. Is there anyone you haven't worked with that you'd like to work with? Uh, I, I, the only person I didn't work with in my life was um, Frank Sinatra, and I got mm -hmm. to call Joe Mallon, his concert master co contractor, called me to play in Atlantic City when I was living in New York, and uh, uh, I already had another gig, so I had to turn it down, and Frank left oh, us three years later. So yeah, I have all his albums, you know. But uh, and he had he always worked with the best arrangers, so if you listen to the arrangers that worked with Frank Sinatra, there's a lot of stuff to be learned, you know, oh. Nelson Riddle especially. But uh, yeah, uh, I, and I've, I've learned a lot about music by transcribing music. A lot of a lot of stuff that Paul would ask me to do at the show was just write down the parts on this record. And so I have learned, uh, you know, how to put records together just by taking them apart, note by note. Wow, that's incredible too, man. What's transcribing that? is that's a that's a that's a whole different animal right oh. there. <laughs> Wow. What yeah. brings you the most joy in life? Uh, making other people happy. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and mostly by, you know, playing music. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I can get, if, if, if I can get to that, you know, musician and magician are almost the same word. Yeah. And, 
<laughs> and you, you probably never thought about this either, but music is invisible. You can watch somebody playing an instrument, you know, playing a cello, playing a guitar, playing drums and stuff. You can watch, you know, the people in motion, but the music itself is invisible. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I like uh, uh, dealing with that. You know, I like uh, communicating with people with the invisible. On the I, yeah, I always, always love that too, like where, you know, you can reach somebody you've never met through your music and touch them and, and, and even change their life. Somebody even in a different country. I mean, you know, it's so amazing. Yes. You know, yes. we can, I, I always think that mu music is, is such a, we don't realize how much communication we receive through music. It's not just. Right. There's no, there's no, tra there's no uh, uh, translation involved in instrumental music. You know, right. I've got four tours of, of Japan and, uh, you know, you don't have to speak a word of Japanese in order to play music that they understand. And exactly. uh, on one tour, we, I, we, did, we did five weeks in, uh, in Japan with Gil Evans. And then we went on a State Department tour to Manila. Hong Kong, wow, Singapore, and Bangkok, and once again, I mean, you're you're really you know you're in a different country when you're yeah. in, in Thailand, but uh, uh, oh my God, uh, but the, you know the, the music the music communicates. That's that's one of the wonderful things I like about instrumental jazz. Yeah, my my wife is Chinese, and we've I've gone to concerts, uh, you know. Uh, Chinese artists. Uh, when we went to Las Vegas, uh, we saw Alan Tam. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, and I've been to China. I went to shows in China with my wife, and uh, it's just yeah, it's amazing. Just me, you know. And she's like, "Are you enjoying yourself?" I'm like, "Of course, I'm enjoying. This is music. I don't, I don't have to know what they're saying in order to, you know, experience the beauty in it." Right. And, right. It's something that that, that touches everybody. Yeah, and, and I actually, uh, years ago, produced, a, uh, it was like a 20-piece African band. Um, wow. Yeah, and, and they, they all came into my studio and recorded the album, and I produced it and, you know, uh, engineered it, and it was, you know, uh, it, was, it, was, it was such an amazing experience, and I got, to, I got to interact with all these musicians that I, I would have never met otherwise, you know? It was just incredible how... Their, their rhythm and timing and uh, oh. and oh yeah and the accents and all the music it was just it, it was incredible I, I was I was in my glory mm. and you know uh, I, I was just mesmerized by their beauty and art of what they did and the music they created was just oh yeah they're 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 more rhythmically advanced than oh, generally God. speaking than American mu musicians you know we we get a little beat going and we you know we play along but the, you know, their their rhythms are, are so so complex and uh, you yeah know, working with Cuban and Puerto Rican salsa people it's the same thing you know the, the rhythms are so far advanced uh, they're so fine and woven it's just like it, 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 it the fabric of it becomes music itself even though it's yeah. it's not like a melodic instrument it, it becomes a melodic instrument by the weaving of the complexity of them all working together yeah it's amazing it, Here's another concept that I came up with. Um, music harmony and color harmony are the same. Like if you bring, you, you can hear eight or 10 octaves, you can only see one octave, but uh, the relationship of the frequencies of the colors are the same. The harmonies are the same as the relationship of the notes. Like, uh, okay, so, so envision red, yellow, and blue. Right. Okay, now these things harmonize and it's kind of a happy, bright thing, right? That's mm -hmm. C, E, and G. Right. Okay. Mm. Yes. You, you break it down to frequencies and uh, imagine orange, green, and purple. Now these harmonize too, but it's a whole different psychological feeling. Mm. And that's that's the D minor chord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, so now music and color harmony are all the same. Well, it's funny that you say that because like Early on, I, I went to guitar lessons. I, I, I literally had only one lesson on guitar. Um, and the, the guitar teacher, which was this was back in Philadelphia at the uh, Jerry's Drum and Guitar Shop uh, in Philly. And uh, the guy says, uh, all right, sit down and play for me. So I'm playing. I'm going up and down the neck and doing all this. I'm doing all these runs and stuff. And he's like, all right, what do you call that? I said, well, I said, uh, I don't know, because I didn't, you know, I was 
to me, I was making it up, you know, it was, and he's like, do you know what the name of that scale is? I'm like, no. He goes, well, what, what do you call it? I said, I call it the happy scale. <laughs> he's like, he's like, that's the major scale. And he get, and then he goes, what's that one you just did? And he stopped me again. He said, what's that one you just said? I said, that's the Egyptian scale. He goes, no, that's a harmonic minor scale. So like, <laughs> yeah. he's the one, like I didn't, I, I didn't know any of the names of anything. I was just like doing it because I liked it and it sounded good to me. And, but he's the guy that I, I give him so many props because he's the one that actually put names to the scales. Right. So when you brought up the color scheme, I, I immediately understood what you meant just because of the way that I learned it was so raw and basic by just emotional, um, naming it emotional feelings from, you know. Yeah. Uh, wow. So yeah, that's, that's how, that was my connection to um, you know, but your color association was so amazing. Just, uh, wow. Uh, yeah, that was cool. Really uh, cool. You know, I know it's, it's, it's almost time to say adieu, so to say, but, uh, but we could keep talking. I mean, I can't wait till your book comes out. Um, I Me hope, too. I'm buying it. I know, right? Um, yeah. I hope someday whenever we open again, maybe you could drop by or something. And would love to. I would absolutely love to. Keep me in mind. Stay in touch. Oh, I'd love it. Tom, we'd love you. We'd love you to come to the studio. We have a beautiful recording studio at our facility too, which is well, really. I have, I have to come by someday. Uh, we would love it. We would absolutely love you to come. You're welcome anytime. Be my pleasure.